Day 1005 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently Russia sits on more than 730,000 military personnel losses, representing an additional 1,020 in the past day. Then as for the hardware losses, four tanks, 17 APVs, five artillery, with recent stats showing that Russian forces are losing infantry mobility vehicles, or IMVs, at a faster rate relative to tanks. With the current ratio standing at one IMV lost for every two tanks, compared to the earlier ratio of one IMV lost per every ten tanks. So essentially we see the changing dynamic, indicating the shifting tides of battle hardware, where Russian forces are now, much more commonly, storming frontline positions with significantly less heavy armoured vehicles, opting to instead use the six-wheel or even four-wheeler vehicles to do so. For Ukraine, this signals an opportunity to exploit weakened armoured capabilities, which could indeed impact the broader direction of this war. Then to take another look at the ruble, and can you believe it? The ruble has already reached another new high with respect to it devaluing as a currency, where one US dollar equals over 104 rubles now. That means the ruble has lost over 22% of its value in the past two and a half months and lost 10% of its value in the past one month and 5% over the past five days. Also noting that the Rivnia, Ukraine's currency, being its own sovereign nation at all, also shows the ruble devaluing against its own currency at 2.52 rubles to one Ukrainian Rivnia. That's right folks, the Russian ruble is even collapsing against the currency of the country that they are invading. Then headed to the main map today, where Ukraine launched a second wave of Attackums missiles overnight, said to target Russian military positions in the Kursk region. Reports confirm multiple strikes, with Russian military sources indicating that areas are engulfed in flames. Specifically, there were reports of a critical hit on the radar of an S-400 air defense system. Now, reportedly, five to six attackums were fired, with Russian telegram channels lighting up about the events, displaying what could only be characterized as dramatic concerns about short-range missiles being fired on them from another country, as if they never had any real expectation of this happening, despite Russia's countless attacks on Ukraine. Then, not long after these events, Kursk Governor Alexei Smirnov announced that Russian air defenses successfully intercepted 27 UAVs and two missiles, which is a fairly standard response to anything that happens with cross-border tensions into Russia, and thus difficult to confirm. Then also now, France has greenlit Ukrainian strikes into Russian territory using Scalp air-launched cruise missiles. Essentially, these are the Storm Shadows. And all of this was according to French Foreign Minister Barrow, with a French government spokesperson stating, quote, there's no red line. When reinforcing support for Ukraine strikes on targets like the reported North Korean command post in Russia's Kursk region. Meanwhile, closer to the front lines of this Russian oblast, Ukrainian special operations forces targeted and destroyed some more Russian equipment, as can be seen here with what's turning into some more difficult terrain leading into winter. Then to look at a bit of an update as to the Koreans in Kursk, with a few bits and pieces coming out here and there, where apart from the Asian army generally going through training and then retraining and then some more training, a recent patch was discovered on the uniform of one of these eliminated soldiers, revealing some expected symbolism etched into their military identity. Investigators are currently examining the patch for clues about the soldier's unit and rank. Now, just to note, this is a zoom-in of the original photo, which is a bit more pleasing to the eyes this way. And I think I just called Kim Jong-un pleasing to the eyes. And so ultimately, chances are we are likely to see more smiling Kims. Then headed further into Russia on the map as over the weekend and far, far to the east as there was a freight train collision, crash or otherwise failure to break at Khabarovsk, leading to speculation of a braking malfunction or otherwise mechanical malfunction. 
Especially as the country faces critical infrastructure challenges, including a shortage of locomotives and essential components like cassette and bearings for the trains, which is only exacerbated by Western imposed sanctions, which has led to increased malfunctions and a significant number of trains being suspended. Further to that, Russian Railways, the fully state-owned company and one of the largest railway networks in the world, is already heavily indebted. With their expenses projected to reach $7 billion in US dollars by 2025 and $4 billion this year, noting that this is just the interest payment costs alone, which is an increasingly paralyzing figure resulting from the Russian central bank's need to push up the interest rates much higher. Russian rail is not looking good. Then headed all the way back but to Moscow as it begins. As we see, a district in Moscow was without power overnight and probably still is today. So you see, even those within the capital's proximity are not safe from the aging Soviet infrastructure of years gone by. Of this event, residents also reported no water running and that the management utility company does not answer calls. Really just a taste of things to come this upcoming winter for, for Russia. Then headed into the Ukrainian map and straight to the Karakova axis, where the talk of the town right now is this new contender for best turret toss, as a Russian T-90M tank experiences a jaw-dropping turret flight after an ammunition detonation. Reportedly launching its turret over 100 meters into the air, about 330 feet, with the previous record might have been said to be about 85 meters, but who can really say for sure at this point? Meanwhile, at this location on the map, Russia continues to consolidate piece by piece around Dalny. And with just north of this axis, a recent concerted effort in pushing directly east of Selodova, west of Selodova, and south of Pokrovsk. And along the river, but below the river to Pokrovsk. A town of which is surely an afterthought to the Russian army at this point. Meanwhile, on the map, well, following the recent Oreshnik ballistic missile events in Dnipro from a few days ago, Russia is really framing this as a success. Even as more recent discoveries come through, such as reports of the missile that uh, may not even have had a conventional warhead used when deployed, let alone a nuclear one. And we also see now that this inaccurate and not very effective missile, given a conventional warhead used on this platform, is actually quite small, as we've found it to be using pre-Putin era relics from the mid-90s in its parts for the so-called modern missile. And I would expect that the height of Russian escalation would be to use another one of these, but to use a conventional warhead as their version of escalating matters. And with maybe half a dozen up their sleeves, with potentially a 50% error rate, these said to be $120 million worth of seemingly not that modernized baloney isn't exactly what you might call a game changer. But then, after this event, Russian cope levels are hitting all-time highs, with Russian state media now claiming that residents of Western countries are apologizing en masse after this most previous Oreshnik missile event, evidently quoting some young guy from the UK as being all the proof they needed for the claim of Western country residents apologizing en masse. But I think we'd all know it by now if that happened. Then taking a look around on the map, because somewhere in the east, a badly damaged, abandoned Russian T-90M tank sits in the Donetsk region, not long before Russia's latest and greatest tank gets swallowed up by a drone-dropped munition, I'm sure, which might have already happened by the time this video completes its upload. Then also in the east, the untimely demise of another Chinese-made Russian golf cart. Was any other outcome ever expected here? Then also somewhere in the east, a 49-year-old Russian soldier dubbed the new Russian stormtrooper has made it through the Russian MOD's most rigorous of tests to become accepted for the most elite units of the infantry assault squad. <laughs> Come on Russia, you're playing a little desperate here aren't you? This is pitiful, even for Russia. What with their use of wounded or permanently wounded disabled soldiers. Then also in the east, something you don't see every day, an AFU thermite dropping drone pouring out its contents and its heart on a Russian turtle tank. 
Then also, in the Luhansk region, a Russian Strela-10 air defense system is seen damaged reportedly due to partisan activity in the region. During the video, there was an active fire seen in the vehicle itself. Although, in fact, it's probably not really been a Strela-10 air defense system for quite some time now, given the extremely imposing nature of the welded-on cope cage. Then, also, this is said to be a Ukrainian assault rifle FPV. With this said to be the first combat deployed use of a rifle equipped FPV, in this case it was said to be an AK-47 or actually I think it was a AK-74 where it was actively patrolling the neighborhood of the front lines, targeting and eliminating threats. Now we've seen it in testing before, about three months ago I would say, maybe a little bit less. So it only makes sense that these plans would sooner or later come to fruition. And imagine the recoil required to be counteracted on this innovation. Clearly some skill and ingenuity required. And so you see, most FPV drones are capable of one or maybe a couple or a few strikes, but this option allows for a great deal of longevity in a single flight. Then just return back to base to get reloaded. So is this the future of warfare? Now, a decade ago, we all might have thought it was human robots with weapons, except the reality, well, it's potentially much more frightening. Flying rifles. Then headed to some news for today, and we'll start off with some Ukrainian hardware news updates. So Canadian Defence Minister Bill Blair announces that the country's provided NASAMS air defence system is now operational in Ukraine, which could be a crucial addition come deep winter during the expected Russian attacks. Now, as it stands, Ukraine operates what appears to be at least 12 NASAMS batteries now. Possibly more if you choose to include all the extra launchers and fire control systems they've received on the site as well. Then, in some more news, but on the same air defense front, Spain announced the delivery of an additional Hawk surface-to-air missile battery to Ukraine. These Cold War-era Hawk missiles have already demonstrated effectiveness against Russian aggression, capable of even taking out cruise missiles, where these older systems continue to show their relevance in air defense as they have undergone updates to enhance their effectiveness against contemporary threats for this homing all-the-way killer, which is impressively what the acronym Hawk stands for. Perhaps before the days where they gave weapon systems more diplomatic names. Then, with a backlog of literally at least 30 Russian mobilization blunder segments, I'm just going to do a, a few rapid fire segments here. So starting off, we still see a few Russian convicts here and there joining the army with the hope of attaining freedom, with this such convict directly appealing to Putin, complaining about the loss of his hand and receiving no medical treatment for it. Yet being denied compensation and medical treatment due to it being labelled as a quote-unquote general illness. Some more of those Russian soldier high standards we see there. And another unread email for Putin's inbox. Then to a second quick blunder, new data confirms previous reports on Russian recruitment for Russia's assault units highlighting a grim trend. Russian blogger Kashera Vova reveals that the average lifespan of a newly contracted soldier is less than three weeks before facing the brutal realities of combat in Ukraine. Now, if Russia instead spent the last three years not going to war, invading Ukraine, and train, actually training their army, then a different reality might stand before us today. Then to a quick final blunder, so the Russian state Duma passed a law allowing the write-off of up to 10 million rubles of debt, as long as someone goes to war. So the state Duma probably realized that many of these indebted individuals will never be able to pay back the, the large sums of debt, leading to using it to the Russian MOD's advantage. As they churn through so much manpower, as we see in the last segment I mentioned, and as we saw with that 49-year-old soldier from just a moment ago too, where it's the status quo they've built for themselves, it's too late to train all of these soldiers. So they are stuck pumping them out as much as they can for as long as they can. What a state of affairs to be in, what a way to be. And so back to this wave in of debt as per the State Duma. Not exactly financial institution friendly, with a number of expectations for 2025 being the year of a wave of Russian bankruptcies, 
or in this case, Russian bank bankruptcies. Then headed to something a bit funny, odd, or different to round it all off with today, guys, and certainly very different. I'll tell you that much, as one of the most frequent issuers of nuclear threats in the world, Deputy Chairman of the Security Council of the Russian Federation, Medvedev, has now done a 180 on nuclear threats, now emphatically stating, quote, we are not crazy and we will not use nuclear weapons. So what happened all of a sudden? In his role of Deputy Chairman of the Security Council, did he audit Russia's strategic weapons arsenals? And did some of those arsenals look like this? Which is said to be an old picture of the conditions of storage of Russian nuclear weapons in the early 90s. And given a lot of things in Russia have gone downhill since then, well can you get any more downhill than this? It feels like a dirty pigsty with a non-solid roof. But back to Medvedev, maybe he's been forced to go on the record by Putin to actually start cancelling out all of his previous nuclear rhetoric due to, say for instance, upcoming changes in the White House, or some top secret memos from the Russian MOD saying they're unable to defend themselves in the case of a nuclear strike from anywhere in the West, which is actually pretty realistic. But I'm grasping at straws here, though it is unusual, hard to say, tell me what you think. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe. And again, thanks for the support. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.